watch this short clip, and then we'll jump into today's episode. Red Onion was opened to be a security level six segregation facility, Supermax. Most offenders remain in the cell 23 hours a day, seven days a week. Ask yourself, can you live in a bathroom for 10 years? It's, I guess you could say inhumane. All I've ever known was violence. It wasn't the solution to the problem, it was just life. Some days your stress level can be out the roof, and it feels like you're doing time. They go back into the real world, and they come back. This is our world. Like to talk to me, Mr. Marsh? Occasionally, we do see that segregation can have harmful effects on a person's mental health. This is like I've forgotten about. Hey, for real, doctor, I need your support. If you don't feel like you're relevant to nobody in that cell, then it'll make you lose your damn mind. It gets to you, and it hurts like hell. All it's doing is turning us into caged animals. I'm just trying to make it. I don't know if hope is what's keeping me going. This is like a forgotten world. Y'all already know what it is. Jay Williams, Let's Live Life, and we're back. So today we're going to get into maximum security prisons. Inmate misconduct. Officer misconduct. Mistreatment. Stabbings. And all that. I know that sounds like a lot to cover. But there's reason behind it and a lot I need to talk about. So let's relive it. My brother called me last night with some news. Before I tell you what he told me, I'm gonna give y'all a quick story of a guy I was in prison with named Carter. Carter was a young black guy, 22 years old, come from a good family, had a good mom, a good dad, brothers, sisters, and I know this because when I would go to the visiting room, he would always have the max amount of visitors, which is four. His mom and dad would always be there. Siblings would be there. For the most part, Carter was not someone that you would typically expect to see in prison. He wasn't what you think of when you think of somebody that's locked up. Carter had a bunch of bullshit charges, ran with some of the wrong guys. You know, he wasn't out there really doing nothing like that, but his homeboys were. They got pulled one night. Nobody spoke up for the guns ever in the car. Carter ended up getting hit with a bunch of gun charges. None of the guns were actually even his. It's four people in the car. They found two guns. He ended up pleading out to eight years on two firearm charges, two stolen firearm charges. I ended up being in prison with Carter. And Carter was quiet. He hung out with more white dudes than he did black dudes. He read a lot. He ran a lot. And he wouldn't be there long before dudes realized that he was an easy target. Guys started taking his commissary. It started with just a little bit. They would go to his cell, hey, let me hold something, borrow something from him, not paying back. Now everybody knows, you know, this is a good guy. We can take advantage of him. He is a goldfish in an ocean full of sharks. It went on from there, from them taking little things to them taking everything. Every time Carter would go to commissary, he'd come back and his gang members would go up in his cell and they would just take everything. If he even so much acted like he had a problem with it, they would beat Carter up, you know, stomp him out, punch him, mess him all up. I seen him beat up, bruised, and knotted up more than a few times, man. Carter eventually got tired of it. And like anything I've told you, it always ends bad. These guys, these gang members were walking the yard one day. Carter was doing his laps like usual. Carter ran up behind him and started stabbing him. He stabbed several different dudes. I think it was three total that he stabbed out of a group of about seven. They jumped him, got the knife from him. The knife got knocked over in the grass. They stomped him out, hurt him real bad. But what's bad is that the officer in the tower... And the officers on the yard saw everything that took place. Here in the state of Virginia, you don't have to press charges on somebody. If they have enough evidence on their own, they will convict you without a witness, without a victim. Well, because the officers witnessed Carter stab these gang members, which he should have, 
He was eventually convicted and shipped off to Red Onion State Prison. He turned his eight years into a whole bunch more time. None of the gang members testified him, testified against of him. None of them told on him. They acted like they didn't know what was going on. They, we don't know what happened. They kept it solid. Carter told them, guys were extorting me. They were taking me, you know, taking my food, taking my cosmetics, beating me up. They taking my sneakers. And I just got tired of it. And I felt the only way it was going to stop is if I showed them that, you know, I wasn't scared. So I got a knife and I ran up on him and stabbed him on the yard. So he gets sent to Red Onion. Red Onion is a the supermax of supermaxes of supermaxes. You can go right now and look up Red Onion and you will find all these different reports. Reports of officers using dogs to attack inmates. Inmates that aren't doing anything. The officer might not like you. And these are facts. So if you're a Red Onion officer and you're watching and you're saying I'm lying, it's not a lie because I talk to people that are there all the time that have no reason to lie to me. They're using these dogs to attack these inmates just on the strength of I've got a dog on a leash. I mean, you've had a couple words. Get him, boy. Get him. Get him. Get him. Next thing you know, you're on the ground. You're screaming, ah, ah. And this dog has got his big, powerful German shepherd jaws locked down on you, biting you, ripping you to pieces, all because this guard don't like you or because y'all had some words. If you do that in the world, you go to prison. And I'm not saying all guards do this. I'm saying there are 100% guards up Red Onion doing that. That's where Carter would end up going. That's the last we heard of Carter. My brother calls me last night. Tells me that two days ago and where he's at, he's currently at Wallace Ridge. You can, you can check out Wallace Ridge in Pound, Virginia, way up in the sticks and the boonies with the hillbillies, the coal miners, the mountain men, the, the women with mustaches and, you know, all that. He's currently at Wallace Ridge. Two days ago, he was going to the yard. He's been having some issues over the phone. I was on the phone with him about a week ago and he, he got into it with a dude over the phone. They had already fought. He was ready to fight again while he was on the phone. I said, bro, look, chill out, man. You come home in October of this year. Chill out. He's like, Jay, you know how it is. You're here until you're here. And he's right. You are there until you are gone. Doesn't matter if you leave tomorrow. You have to get, carry yourself the same way all the way until you walk out that gate to make sure you survive and you get out. So apparently he had some issues with a couple of different dudes. He had beat one of the dudes up. Dude's homeboys and them weren't feeling it. So he had got word that there was going to be problems. Two days ago, they're going out to the yard. He's 23 and one, locked in a cell 23 hours a day, out for one. You get an hour wreck. You know, he's going to yard time. And they have a metal detector you have to go through. Metal detectors everywhere. Majority of the inmates there have stabbings, murders, high profile cases. They're going to be up there 23 and 1 for many, many years before they ever get their custody level dropped and get to another prison. He says that usually when you get to that metal detector, a lot of times there's not a guard there. And they weren't expecting there to be a guard there that day. He wasn't. He said he walked up. And by the time you get to the metal detector, it is too late. It's controlled movement, which means anywhere you go, you are escorted by an officer. So when you get to the metal detector... If you see a guard standing there, you don't have the option of saying, hey, I want to go back to my cell. So all the guys walk through the metal detector and the metal detector goes off. Sergeant standing there, he tells them, hey, nah, something ain't right. Y'all go through it again. They go through it again and it beeps again. They tell them, pull them all to the wall, search everybody. So now you got all these men standing on the wall with their hands on the wall, facing the wall. And officers patting him down. They find my brother with two shanks on him. He's got these two homemade prison knives he's made. Going to the yard to make sure that. Not going out there to stab anybody. But he's going out there with the intent of staying alive. He's going out there knowing that if this shit turns bad. And they run up on me with blades. I can pull mine out. One in each hand. And I can defend myself against these dudes. 
And like I told you, these aren't your everyday guys up there. These aren't the, the little guy that stole your car up there. These are guys that are all there because they are violent. My brother is there at Wallace Ridge right now because he was assaulted by an officer at Nottaway Correctional Center by a sergeant. He was punched while he was on the ground, retaliated by, you know, hitting the guard back. And the guard sergeant just went on about his business and they shipped my brother to Wallace Ridge. Well, now that he's gotten caught with these two knives, he's got to go to Red Onion. HBO did a documentary on Red Onion. Now, you know, this is a messed up place when you have all of America and everybody watching, you know, everybody's from different states, different cities, countries, different parts of the world. For HBO to take interest in this prison and want to go inside of Red Onion and videotape what's going on, it has to be something to it. I've done time with a lot of guys that did time at Red Onion. And they all tell these horror stories of the things that take place up there. I had a cellmate that had done many years. I think he did eight years total at Red Onion. He did almost two years in the hole before he was let out. I met a guy at Greensville named Fire. And salute to you, Fire, if you ever see this, man. Fire's a roster. A rude boy, a real one. When he came into prison, part of the prison rules are you have to shave your head. Fire told him, it's against my religion to shave my head. I'm a Rasta, I can't shave my head. Fire would go on to be, and I'm glad that I met Fire, he would go on to be one of the longest housed inmates to ever stay in the hole that long, 15 years fire spent in the hole he was doing i believe it was 20 years for robbing a convenience store and he spent 15 of those years in the hole the cellmate i was just telling you about that had done all that time at red onion and wallens ridge would talk to himself as if there was a third person in the cell i'd be sitting in my bunk He'd be up over above me sitting on his bunk watching his TV. He'd be like, bro, he got his headphones in. He'd be like, bro, this shit's crazy. You see this? Man, they wildin', they wildin'. And I take my headphones out, I'd be like, what? And I look up and I realize he's got his headphones in. He's not talking to me. He's talking to himself. This is what happens when you take a man and you throw him away and you put him somewhere by himself for that amount of time. Once you have no one to talk to, no friends, nobody converse with, no one to kick it with, who do you talk to? You start to talk to yourself. And I know this to be true because I've done a lot of time in the hole. It's a slow form of torture. You start to go crazy. You've done everything you can while in that cell to try to entertain yourself. From counting how many bricks are on the wall, making a makeshift basketball hoop out of some paper you know laying on the floor and playing chess with a guy that's in another cell by marking out a piece of paper that's numbered and then it's got alphabets on the side making little pieces of paper that might say pawn king queen and you yell down to the next cell my pawn is moving from c1 to c3 and then he tells you his move and you've got pieces of paper on your on your little board in your cell that represent his guys so you can see his pieces. He's got the same thing set up in his cell so you can he can see your pieces and y'all are laying on the floor if you can visualize what I'm saying. Playing chess while yelling underneath the door. If you're lucky to have someone around you that you can talk to or that's not completely crazy. So in talking to my brother, man, I kind of got for a moment, I was agitated that he has now went from the second highest prison in Virginia and is now going to be shipped to 
the most maximum security facility there is. And I had to think back to my days incarcerated because I've been out seven years now. I had to think back to what it was to know you had problems or that something was brewing in the air. And I had to think back to what it felt like to be walking that yard with that knife tucked inside your pants. Knowing that today might be the day that you kill somebody and spend the rest of your life in prison. Now, I've never been one that boasts violence, thinks violence is cute, makes a mockery out of prison. This ain't that channel. If you want to laugh, I might have a sense of humor, but I'm never going to belittle what these guys are in there going through, what I've been through, or what the reality of the situation is. Never. This ain't a comedy skit. You ain't going to catch me on here wearing wigs. You ain't going to catch me on here imitating people trying to make y'all laugh because of somebody else's misery. It's not going to happen. In those moments of walking that yard with that knife, think about, you know, what I might have to possibly do to somebody. I always tried to vision somebody as a baby, as a child, as a teenager. And that's how a lot of times I would keep myself from stabbing somebody or trying to kill somebody. No matter how I felt about you, what was going on, I would try to look at you and think that once upon a time, somebody held that guy in their arms and fed him a bottle or put a tit in his mouth. Once upon a time, he was a baby that learned to walk. He was somebody that learned to crawl. And when I think about it like that, it would help me deal with the anger I had inside. And a lot of times it would keep me from attacking. There were situations, there have been situations in my life where I've been backed into that corner, had no other option but to use that blade. And if you've never been in that situation, let me tell you something. It's scary. It's a terrifying feeling knowing what you're about to do to somebody else. Knowing that you could possibly kill this person this person could possibly tell on you and you could get sentenced to more time. You could possibly get seen by someone else and they tell on you, which is very common. Dudes tell for no reason and you could get more time. Then there's the whole, what if he's got a knife? What if he gets it, get my knife from me and start stabbing me? There's so much that goes to your mind when these things are going on that it's overwhelming. I got into it with a lifer one time and he ran up in the cell and it was one of those situations where it was pretty much him or me. I knew he was coming. I seen him coming. I went ahead and I grabbed my knife and he come in there. As soon as he come through the door, I hit him with it. And the crazy part is when you're doing something like that, you don't really feel like you're doing that much damage. You don't. You feel like you need to push harder or swing harder. When in reality, it doesn't take much force to push a sharp object into somebody's body. And that's what I would end up doing. And this dude would go from, he thought he had the upper hand, not knowing I had this sharp piece of plexiglass in the cell. He would go on from thinking that he was about to victimize me and do something to me, to hooting and hollering and screaming and running away from me as I jabbed his ass up. That wasn't the scariest part. The scariest part was when we went on lockdown and they come in there investigating and go on cell to cell questioning people, pulling people out their cells all day, all night, searching cells for signs of blood. That was the scary part. The scary part was, have I just defended myself yet cost myself my freedom? Am I now not going home? Did I just turn 10 years into 40? And the guy survived. And luckily, he was a lifer. He was a convict, not an inmate. He didn't tell him what happened. He said he didn't know who stabbed him. My brother is headed to a place that is a world, like I tell you, a crazy world. Inside of this already crazy world that we live in. 
He's headed to a place that most of y'all couldn't imagine. He's headed to a place that I'm glad he's only going to have to spend seven months at. You got to think he's already at a place that's long-term segregation, which is Wallens Ridge. But Red Onion is the definition of cruel and unusual punishment. Yes, there are a lot of men that are in prison that should never see the streets again. I agree to that. I've met guys that are not fit to be out here in the public, standing behind your mom in a grocery store. This is not a guy you want your 85-year-old grandma to actually rear end at a red light because there's a chance he's going to pull up from the car and beat her to death. So I do understand why they give life sentences and why some guys will never get out. What I don't understand is how they feel that they can send you away to a place like that where you're forgotten about, where you don't talk to anybody for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, where they can sick their dogs on you, beat you, refuse you medical service, refuse you a phone call so that you can't call your loved ones and tell you what's going on, tell them what's going on. And how they can then turn around and think that's going to help anybody. I hope and pray that when my brother comes home, there's something I can do to get him on the path I'm on. I've been on. Me and my brother were the complete opposites. I grew up getting in trouble. Trouble was something that started for me at a young age. He used to come see me in the detention centers. He would come see me in jail. He would come see me in prison. And it wouldn't be until he was in his late 20s that he ended up getting in trouble. And it all started behind him working for a landscaping company. He had a backpack blower on. They just cut the grass and was blowing the grass clippings out of the street. This is a nice, big, rich subdivision. And a woman comes around the corner not paying attention. Runs him over and breaks his leg. Back and forth to the hospital. The docs are prescribing him any type of pain medication he wants. They're just pumping him full of Percocets, Oxys, all these things. And guess what? One day, those prescriptions stop. Now, you've been on Percocets, Oxycontin for the last year. And now they're telling you you don't get no more. And you become deathly ill. You become sick to the point... That you feel like you're going to die. And then someone steps in the picture. And introduces you to heroin. You take it. And all those pains go away. You're no longer sick. That would be the road that led my brother. To where he's currently at. Got to the point that. You know. We had fallen out. He had stolen from me. And that's. I'm not going to say what his addiction did. Because that was his choice. But that's what happened. I fired him and he went on to rob a store to get the money he needed. He's paid for his crimes. He's been beat several times since he's been locked up by these guards. And I salute him for keeping the ten toes down. Even in the most scariest and dark moments. What lies ahead of him is a world that some of you will never understand. Google Red Onion State Prison, Virginia. Google Wallens Ridge State on uh, Wallens Ridge State Prison in Virginia. Build your own opinion on it. And we'll go from there, man. I'm gonna jump out of there. If anybody wants you, let me know and I'll give you my brother's contact information. You can find him on JPay, Jesse McMillan, M C M I L L I A N. On JPay, it's an app. Type in his middle name is Lee. Type it in. All his information will come up. Download the app. Reach out to him because he's going to need it. Where he's going isn't anything nice. But y'all know what this is, man. These prisons, institutions, these places, they're just crazier worlds. Inside of this already crazy world we live in. Y'all know what I'm doing. 
I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And as always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life to all my real ones and the awesome real ones watching. Because y'all still watching me. Y'all know how we do, man. Salute.